It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Joseph Wallenstein. Hey, Joe, how are you? How are you, sir? Doing fine, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. Sure, thanks for having me. I was looking over your bio. You were the producer of Knots Landing in Seventh Heaven, yeah? Yes, I was the first producer of Knots Landing, and I did the first few years of Seventh Heaven. Okay. That's correct. I am old enough to remember those shows. (laughs) (laughs) I'm trying to think. Who was the star of Knott's Landing, though? That's that's slipping my mind. That was Don Murray and Michelle Lee. And, Michelle Lee, uh, right, okay. Michelle Lee, yeah. And uh, then the second or third year, Donna Mills joined the cast. Julie Harris. We had a wonderful cast. Julie Harris, oh, right, okay. And then in Seventh Heaven... Um, Stephen Collins, Catherine Hicks, uh, Jessica Biel. Jessica yeah. Beale, right. Okay. Yeah, that that's going back a ways. Those were <laughs> early 80s, those shows, right? Correct. In the, well, uh, Knott's was, Pilot was 79, then 80, 81, and 23, yeah. And I think 7, 7 was a little towards the back of the 80s, yeah. Was that, uh, 7, 7, was that the David Gallagher, the boy? Yeah, it sure was. Okay. And okay. several years later, he came to USC, where I'm working. Oh, all right. Is he studying film? I think he was. Yeah, I think he was. I lost track of him, actually. He was there for a couple of years. There's so many kids there, and we do so many projects. So now, I guess that's, there's my segue. Uh, so now you are, uh, you're running the uh, USC Film School? Well, the production, physical production department, which is the department which helps the kids actually make their films. Uh, we do a lot of them, too. Um but, they're, you know, some are five minutes, some are 30 minutes, but they all have the same elements. Script, cast, crew, you know, equipment, location, stages, yeah. Well, there's got to be much more mass production these days than before when you were using real film. Digital must have completely changed that whole thing, yeah? Yeah, well, it has, it has. And, and also, when I started there, we were strictly 35 millimeter. Now we have a games division, an animation division. We do a lot of digital, <laughs> and um, it's quite, quite something, quite an operation. <laughs> oh, I'll bet. I've had this conversation with other people. A lot of filmmakers, indie film guys come on this show, and everybody pretty much agrees that it's a two-way street. It's a double-edged sword with digital. Because on the one hand now, it's almost possible for anyone to make a film, that's the good news, and the bad news is now it's possible for anyone to make a film. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, uh, but content will always be king, and content is subjective. But uh, one of the things that I think is going to happen in film and, and digital is uh, these virtual backgrounds are going to change the actual dynamic of what you film and how much it costs to do it and how long it takes. It's an interesting time. But I have to admit, um, I am a 35 millimeter person. I love that. I love that process of filmmaking, touching film, actually. Yeah. Well, I think there is some sort of charm to that. And also, it has a different look. I mean, whatever you want to do to digital, you can actually, you know, sort of manipulate it to look like film. But I right. f- film still looks like film. And you I, bet. Yeah. I mean, uh, when they, I forget what, what the, it was one of Martin Scorsese's pictures, they they did it on digital, and it looked like I was watching a daytime soap. The thing about <laughs> film was it gave you that separation from the film. There was something in between you and the film, whereas when that went away, it all looked like daytime television. The colors were too bright. It was, I didn't like it. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think people look better a little softer on the film, yeah. you know, when I've seen some digital productions like in 4K where people, right. they're just every pimple and every little 
blemish on their skin shows where in film it's, well, you know it's, yeah. <laughs> no, I know a lot of actresses at the beginning complained because uh, the cameras could actually see through the makeup. Yeah. And yeah. and they did a lot of it. Uh, but it finds its way. No, I mean, what's ironic is that we all this digital, digital, and now we have kids who say, can't we please learn 16 millimeter? <laughs> 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 yeah. I was Sorry. just going to say, I do like digital for manipulation, for editing, um, right. that is beautiful because I don't know the old days of actually cutting film and gluing it. And, and I'm sort of glad that those days are gone, but in terms of actual shooting and the stock that you use, and there is something nice about film if you can afford it, it's not cheap to make right. a film that way. Just processing. And right. Here's something you'll find funny when I first started because I was an assistant director a very long time ago. And the joke was, uh, when you would work with certain actors, the director would say, uh, okay, take 22, and then he'd turn to the script supervisor and say, print one and two. <laughs> <laughs> but they would just burn <laughs> just burn film, but you couldn't afford to process all that film. Because it was right. expensive. And plus you get your, your dailies instantly with digital. Right? Uh, well, that's right, sure. Yeah. And theoretically, you would think, oh, lighter equipment, LED lights, uh, things will get cheaper. Well, they did below the line, but then the money got pushed above the line to the actors, the writers, the directors. So somehow movies still cost an arm and a leg. You know what confuses me, and maybe you can answer this question, because I've always wondered, why is CGI so expensive when you would think, think it would be cheaper than actually building and sets and, you know? bench time, I would imagine, if you look at some of these big CGI movies and you look at the credits at the end, the credits go on for forever. They're like 200 people working on it. You know? Uh, and so it's it's salary and bench time and fringe mm. would be my guess. Okay. I, I thought, you know, it's got to be cheaper than building a, a backlot set with all the construction and, you know, but I guess well, the, that could actually, yeah. depending on what the set is, that could probably be true. I don't know. I don't think. I, I don't think. At least in my experience, the one answer across the board. You know, I actually when they did um, Avatar, we actually went down to look at the warehouse where they set stuff up. It was massive. Yeah, you know, the set built even for the the digital work. And I've seen some of the documentaries of. Uh, of uh, George Lucas when he was doing Star Wars, and even with all the CGI they were using, the, their sets were still massive for that. Yeah. So, all right. Well, listen, you got a book to promote. The book is called Flynn and Miranda, and tell the basic story. I know everybody's heard of Miranda rights, but maybe you can just tell us a quick, quick story of what actually happened. Well, Miranda was uh, a career criminal uh, who. Uh, attacked a woman in a parking lot and stole eight dollars and a few weeks after that abducted and raped a young girl took her out to the desert he was caught he uh, was taken to the police station he kept asking for an attorney and he was denied he uh, finally they put him in a lineup and the girl who he uh, raped did not identify him but when they were leaving, he said to the arresting officer, how did I do? Meaning, how did he do in the lineup? And the officer, who was very frustrated, said, you flunked miserably. So Miranda thought he'd been identified. They go back to the poli into the interrogation room, and a, a police matron walks the girl across, just leaving the building. And for a minute, they locked eyes, and Miranda turned to the cop and said, yeah, man, that's her. And that served as his confession. The officer ran in, and then they began to say, you know, what about the woman in the parking lot? We don't have to press charge if you'll admit to this. We're... And he'd already been in prolonged custody. Didn't know. He'd waived the right to a preliminary hearing because he didn't know how to defend himself. And he was convicted. Then he was in jail, and he filed his own appeal uh, with the Arizona State Court, and uh, it was denied. The ACLU got interested in it, but there was no ACLU office in Phoenix in 1962. So they um, 
used the correspondent attorney, a fellow by the name of Robert Corcoran, who had been a district attorney when Miranda's case went through. But he knew that it was going to be a very controversial, very unpopular case if it ever got taken beyond the state courts, because it was going to appear that they were questioning how the police operated, and they felt all their dirty laundry would be aired on the public stage. So he couldn't just reach out for to say, who wants to take this case? He needed to find somebody with the guts, the stamina, the intelligence, the ego to do it. Now, some time ago, American Heritage magazine did an article called 10 People You've Never Heard Of Who Changed Your Life. And one of the people in that article was the attorney John Flynn. So Corcoran, uh, Flynn had agreed to two indigent cases a year on behalf of his law firm. He was working with Lewis and Roker, which was the premier law firm in 1962 in Phoenix. And Miranda was the second one that came up, and he took it. And he correctly felt that the time was right. But in order to explain the time is right, I got to tell you that in 1962, in this country, it was possible to be taken from your home, accused of a crime, kept in prolonged custody, tricked into uh, bearing witness against yourself. And nothing that the police, the courts, the judge, nothing they did was wrong. That's the way it was. Problem was that the confession in those days was always inherently tainted because any lawyer would go into, worth his salt, would go into court and say, sure, my client confessed. They beat him to within an inch of his life and blind the jury to all the facts of the case. So Miranda came along. It wasn't what about whether Miranda was guilty or innocent. It was had he been given due process. And, and Flynn correctly judged that the court, at that point the Warren Court, was hearing Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendment cases that the time might be right for them to take a case like this. And it wasn't, he didn't set out to change the legal system. He set out to uh, get clarification because all the police agencies operated differently. They didn't have one set of standards to go on. So, uh, and he was right. The court did want to hear it. And, uh, that, and, and the reason it's Miranda, as opposed to anything else, there were four four cases, Miranda and three companion cases, but their last names started further down the alphabet. So here's Ernesto Miranda, street criminal. His name happens to start with the 13th letter, and now he's the, the name is everywhere. It's the Miranda decision, Miranda, Miranda. So, and what happened after that was it was jawed loose in the legal community that the system really was in need of an overhaul. And one of the outgrowths of that decision was the Burger Commission, which sought to uh, come up with the criminal code, the Code of Criminal Procedure, which they did, and which is in place in all 50 states today. So that's the basic story of Flynn and Miranda, these two very different guys, both flawed in different ways, who ended up as a Miranda. One of them ended up as a household word. The only guy, very few people get their names to be a verb. <laughs> Oh, but that's it's true. A common verb was the yeah. suspect Mirandized. Right, exactly. And Flynn, I would suspect most people have never heard of. Uh, not outside of Phoenix. He was well known in Phoenix because yeah. he would he had a very high exoneration rate of uh, criminal case of uh, first strike that of murder cases and kidnapping. He got a lot of people off. Uh, because he really demanded, you know, he believed if you're going to convict somebody, you better prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And uh, he was just very sharp. But he was always controversial. He had been a prosecutor. Uh, he actually had the guts to sue the Arizona Republic for inf a Republic newspaper for income tax evasion. So he was always there locally, high profile and controversial. This just put him on the national stage. So you had mentioned um, in that description, you had mentioned the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments, which I assume yes. were already there a long time before Miranda, right? That's correct. Well, Fourth Amendment was, uh, uh, Matt versus Ohio was a Fourth Amendment case. Uh, and then came Clarence Gideon and Danny Escobedo. 
each one, one was fifth, one was sixth. So the point was that the Supreme Court, the Warren Court, this conservative court, had already uh, been willing to hear cases uh, about the Bill of Rights. And really, one of the things that happened with Miranda is the Bill of Rights now is applied to individuals in conflict in their uh, individual states, which was not the case in 1962. Yeah, I just from what I've read and from what I've seen, particularly in Los Angeles, I know that the police force in L.A. was majorly corrupt <laughs> from the time of its inception, probably. And right. I would suspect that, yeah, before Miranda, it was very local. And people didn't follow any sort of national guidelines, if there were any. Were well, there? There were, that's just the point. There were no national guidelines. There okay. were, that's, see, here's the thing. America, the greatest country on earth, and one of its greatest closely held principles is we are about fairness. Right. That's all he was, it was Miranda tre or anybody treated fairly, you know. The wealthy, the well-connected, the highly educated, they get treated well. But if you're poor and unknowledgeable and a minority and insecure in general, don't know what you're, where you belong in our society, and these cops come and they put you in a room and they stand over you with their guns on their hips and they, you don't know what your rights are, it is intimidating. It is intimidating. So, um, and what Miranda said to Flynn which really set the wheels in motion. He said, when the cops came to my door and said they wanted me to go downtown with them, Miranda said, I didn't know if I had the right to tell them to go to hell. And Flynn said at that mo to the court, at that moment, the only person who could tell him what his rights were was the police officer who came to arrest him. And Earl Warren, who was very much uh, anti-coercion, mentality as a, as a jurist sided with Flynn. You know, interesting thing, which I didn't know at the beginning, but I learned through my research, Earl Warren's father had been murdered. And the police in his office went out to find who did it, and they beat a confession out of the guy. Huh. And, and Warren refused to accept the confession because of the way it was obtained. And the killer went free. And Flynn knew that when he went to court. Now, I'm not saying that that, I mean, yes, as a movie, that would be a very wonderful, dramatic moment. <laughs> <laughs> and God knows I'm not above using it. <laughs> um, but uh, he, because there was always this debate, is it Sixth Amendment, is it Fifth Amendment, is it the right to an attorney? And Stanley, Flynn really rolled the dice, although he, to me, he downplayed it. He said, oh, no, it wasn't anything I did. It was really the facts in the case. But one of the facts in the case is, at that moment, he said to Warren, no, it's Fifth Amendment. Um, he didn't know that he didn't have to bear witness against himself. And where does the right to remain silent fall in? Is that which one of those? That's Fifth, Fifth that, Amendment. Fifth Amendment, okay. So yeah. your right to self-incrimination, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and that, that language appears in the Fifth and Sixth Amendment, not to not bear witness against yourself. But that, that the Bill of Rights is a federal document. And in 1962, 18,000 police office, you know, um, agencies, I don't think two of them operated exactly the same. Mostly the same, but not exactly the same. And that meant that every lawyer was going to challenge the confession. And, and the other thing Flynn was right about was... He said, if they can't depend on the confession, they'll turn their attention to scientific corroboration, which is absolutely true. Forensics, DNA, all kinds of uh, voice pathology, fingerprint, you name it. <laughs> Excuse me. And now when they go into court, if there's a confession, it sticks. It, it's not overturned because he did have an attorney. Well, he did know he didn't have to bear witness, you know, to himself, against himself. And uh, it just created an even playing field, which personally I think is a good thing for this country. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, Joe, we got to wrap this up. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Do you have a website that you want to give out, a personal one or one for the book? I, I, I do not at the moment. That's being developed as we speak. I should have it in a week or two. If I can, if I don't know if this is uh, cool, but I call you back when I get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can send it to us and we'll add it to the show notes. Um, uh, okay. 
you know, we'll just add it into the notes. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. All well, right. thank you. It's nice to meet you. Nice meeting you, too, and nice talking to you, and uh, best of luck with this book. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on the Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. DJC Music and DJC Productions are pleased to announce a brand new website. We have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests. This is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of the Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Love coffee, huh? But wait a minute. It seems like every time you finish a cup of coffee, you get all of these side effects along with it. Heartburn, digestion, upset stomach, acid reflux. As the world's first and only organic acid-free coffee, Tyler's Coffee is able to provide a healthier option in the solution for more than 100 million individuals who have sensitive stomachs or suffer from acid-related modalities. This is Tyler's Acid-Free Coffee. Coffee without the consequences. Hi, this is John Morgan, production supervisor for DJC Productions. You're listening to The Douglas Coleman Show. Okay, please welcome to The Douglas Coleman Show, Megan Davis. Hi, Megan. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Oh, doing fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming on the Thanks show. Thanks for having me. Oh, uh, let's see. We're going to talk about COVID and how it's affecting actors. I know that a lot of my guests that come on the show are performing artists, musicians, actors, filmmakers. Um, I've had some dancers and stand-up comics as well. Everybody has had a real rough time for the last year. Is Hollywood still kind of locked down in terms of making productions? Are they limited? Or what's going on there now? You know, it, it is opening back up uh, slowly but surely. I filmed my first movie back in January um, of 2021. But I had a friend who filmed her first movie back in July. So it it slowly started to open back up. I think I saw a lot more productions outside of California first. Uh, and then and then slowly productions in California started to open back in, uh, as well. And, and the one I did was actually here in Los Angeles back in January. But we, we had to shut down two different times because on two separate occasions, um, two different crew members tested positive. So the whole production shut down, and then we had to wait a certain period of time. Everyone had to get tested multiple times and then come back negative multiple times before we could start filming again. So it's been, it's been interesting, for sure. It's definitely different on set than it, than it used to look. Did they put limits, like how many people could actually be on the set at the same time and people had to wear masks when they weren't filming and I mean were there all sorts of restrictions like that yeah I mean I got the the, the movie I just did I got I think it was probably a, a 29 page packet before uh, the first day of filming that you had to read and sign off on with specific instructions as to how many people could be in each section and each like, section was a different area so Basically, like only so many people could be in the filming area. Only so many people could be in the video village area. Separate video villages were set up for separate people. Um, everyone on the crew not only had to wear uh, an N95 approved face mask, but also a face shield or some other kind of covering too. And then for actors, uh, we all had to wear face masks and then could only take them off when filming. So when rehearsing, we had masks on 
which, as you can imagine, I mean, not obviously a, a life or death issue, but when you have a certain makeup and, and you're wearing certain lipstick, presents quite the challenge for um, the makeup department when you're speaking with your mask on, they keep having to redo it and it's all over your face. So, um, but, but I, I admire how seriously the production team took it and I admire the links that they went to to keep everyone safe. Um, it definitely felt very safe in terms of set. Do you think it was worth it though for the production companies to go through all of that? Because obviously the cost had to be tremendous that would add on to the cost of the production rather than just shut it all oh, down? Yeah, yeah it, I mean, it definitely adds on to the cost of it. Uh, I, I think it is worth it for them. I, I don't know. Um, obviously, I, I, I wasn't really looking at their, the budget for them, but um, I think they they made it work in different ways. I mean, even things as simple as craft, you know, the craft services table is a whole different world. It's it's now, you know, an entire table with everything in containers and someone behind the table, behind a huge um, sheet of, of plexiglass with gloves, with a mask, who, who hands you the specific thing that you request, you know, versus before where it's obviously kind of just a big buffet. But I think, you know, even, even down to because SAG is, is so serious about keeping the performers safe and, and if it's a SAG production, you have to have a SAG representative on set to ensure that all of the rules are being followed. But I think that the cost, you know, is is not as much as, as they still stand to make by making the film and, and, and making the television show. I know a lot of my friends on, on bigger television network shows um, you know, one thing they're doing that's really interesting is they have season long extras, which never happens. I mean, usually extras are, you know, different every day, um, you know, hundreds of different people every day. But in order to prevent the, the spread of the disease, they just hired extras for the season. And then the extras are asked to follow the same guidelines that the people in the show are asked. Um, in terms of not seeing anyone, in terms of obviously very strictly re relegating the the interactions they have with the outside world, and and everyone is tested so often. I think one week I took like six tests in seven days. Oh wow! Is it that the swab up the nose one? Yeah. <laughs> oh God! Six in one week. Well, it's it's you know it's it's better or worse depending on who's giving it. Some people just have the touch. It's like you, they can do it, and you practice, they don't notice. And then other people, it's it's miserable. Uh, yeah, I guess that's true. I mean, anybody who's had blood drawn, some people really yeah. know how to put that needle in. You don't even feel it, and other people stick it in like they're they're stabbing you with a knife, and then you get a giant bruise at that spot in the middle of your your elbow on the, you know, the part on your arm. And it's like, it's the bruise stays <laughs> totally. there for weeks. Have you been vaccinated? Uh, I actually have been. I had my first vaccine um, and I'm getting my second one tomorrow. Do you know which one you're getting? The Pfizer or the Moderna yeah, one? Yeah, I got Pfizer. Pfizer. It wasn't, wasn't like a choice thing. It was just, you know, what they gave you. But I was actually really excited <laughs> to get Pfizer. <laughs> <laughs> so you had no side effects from it? You know, I I did have one. Um, my arm was really sore. And I thought, you know, really, really genius idea. I was like, well, I'll just do an arm workout with weights to, to move it around, you know, because maybe that's the problem. Maybe it just needs to move around. And I did that, and it was miserable. It was such a bad idea. You probably should have put an ice pack or something on it rather than trying right. to move or, it around. Or just not done anything. Or not done relax. anything, yeah. So you want to talk a little bit about your latest film? Yeah, I'd love to. I, it, was, uh, it was very fun because it it's called The Christmas Family Reunion, and it was written and directed by Jake Helgren, who I love. He's such a great director and uh, produced by Ninth House Films with him, Jake and Autumn. And it was very fun because... I got to enjoy Christmas for practically a whole nother month after December. 
I even kept my Christmas tree up. <laughs> but uh, it was shot in Los Angeles and 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 very cold. I think one night we shot a party. What what would what's going to be a party scene in the film outside? And it was thirty degrees. And of course, we're all wearing dresses. You know, like it's the typical Los Angeles winter, which is all sixty right. degrees. So, what's um, the film about? Give us a give us a synopsis. Uh, it's about a family who has a uh, Christmas reunion, and they hire a party planner to plan their Christmas family reunion. And she ends up falling for one of the gentlemen in the family. Um, kind of the the two family members leading the charge for the the reunion are uh, Tiffany and her cousin and I play Tiffany's a, a famous singer and I play her music producer it's a oh, very man. fun role and I actually got to be blonde which is the first time I've been blonde in a movie so that was interesting what what color is your hair normally it's normally very very dark brown almost black oh wow I've had some experience changing my hair color back in the day when I was a uh, really a struggling rock musician. Yeah, I used to, you know, change it to green and purple and do all those kinds oh, of things. Oh, it's so much more fun. But uh, I have very dark hair normally, although now it's white, but that's just from age. <laughs> but back when I had really dark hair and I wanted to go blonde, it was very difficult to do because mm -hmm. dark hair tends to be stronger to to try to turn it lighter. I don't know. Did you have that problem? Did they have to, like, take all the color out first and then add the blonde? Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. I, I played, because uh, I love theater, and I did a theater show. I was actually doing theater for three years regularly before the pandemic, so I miss it so much. Um, but I played a character that was blonde in theater, and because of how small the time frame was between rehearsal and our first show they ended up just buying a wig because it it does take a little bit to to turn your hair from dark to blonde but I did it in the middle of the pandemic because I was just so frustrated with everything and I felt like you know what I'm going to do something that's fun just for me you know and it did take a while to, to turn it um it, it doesn't take very long to go back, you know, to no. dark, but uh, it takes a while to, to, cause they have to bleach it. And then, yeah, just like you said, they have to add the blonde and then add the low lights and highlights. So it, it does take a while, but it was really fun. And, you know, it was, it was fun to do something during that time. Maybe it's, maybe it seems silly, but um, it gives you some kind of an illusion of having some control in your own life. Well, it's true. And, it, you know, it's like painting a room. I mean, if you've ever painted a room that had dark paint and you wanted to paint it white, it took like five coats because it kept bleeding through. But if you wanted to change a white room to a dark color, it takes one. And <laughs> yeah, that's a great analogy. It's, it's really I the same thing. I painted my walls in just random nights when, you know, because you know, you're, you're a, a musician, you just want to do something. And I've painted, I think both of my walls have dark, dark writing on it for no reason, really. So that'll be fun to paint back. Yeah, I, I do that. Sometimes I just move the furniture around because I just want to move it around, you know, for no right. particular reason. I think, I think creative totally. people are like that. We just, we get upset with things if they don't have some purpose <laughs> or, or we're not doing something to be creative if we're just sitting there. I think we go crazy. Totally. Yeah. I have one wall that now says second star to the right and straight on <laughs> the morning. And I think the landlord came in one time to fix something and looked at the wall and looked at me and just didn't say anything. And I was like. Well, if they didn't say anything, then that's good. Let's uh, talk a little bit about normal. You've got that on your bio here. And we keep hearing that on the news about the new normal. I've heard that phrase mm -hmm. many, many times. None of us exactly know what that's going to be. What do you think? Do you think we're going to, once this vaccine gets out and everybody gets vaccinated or most people, are we going to go back to like this thing never happened? We're going to have concerts again. We're going to have people being able to hug and kiss each other without fear or, 
Or do you think that this pandemic has been like a reset moment for the world where everybody's going to be a little bit more standoffish with people and a little bit more careful about touching and getting too close? And what do you think? Ah, oh, man, I, of course, yeah, of course, there is no way to know. But I, I guess my answer to that would be both in a way. I think, I definitely think the handshake is probably on its way out. Um, but I do think that human beings, they're such energetic creatures and, and they, you know, there's, there's all the different scientific laws of energy can't be created or destroyed. It can only be transferred. And I think this has been so hard on human beings in the way that we thrive off of energetic exchanges. I mean, not just artists, everybody does. Right. And not having those exchanges, not not having those, you know, those times of communion, for lack of a better word, of coming together, of spending time together, I think has really taken a toll on everybody. So I definitely think we will get back to that. I think the road back to that won't be overnight. Um, I, I think, you know, I don't know if you've had this experience, but there have been a couple of times since things have been a little bit more open. Obviously, they're not open, open in California. Um, but where I've, you know, done a lot more than I have on most days in the last year. And I just feel exhausted by things that should not exhaust. Give me an know? example. And I, Well, I, I think, you know, I used to work at eight eight to 12 hour day filming and then go to the store and then get ready, go to my friend's birthday dinner and then go to the club to go dancing after. And that was all fine. You know, now I go to the store and I go to the post office and I'm like, <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, oh, really I, see what out of me. I don't I don't know if I can go anywhere else today. And I think that that's just, you know, in a way that might be good um, because I think a lot of us were so on the go that we weren't really that conscious of, of where we were placing our energy. We weren't really that conscious of how burnt out we really were, you know, but in, in another way, it's going to take a while to build up that energetic tolerance again to a certain level. Cause it's just now not what we're used to anymore. Um, so I think both kind of to answer your question, I hope, Obviously, um, to to be back at concerts, to be back at the theater, to to be back doing theater, um, there's just nothing like that. And as you know, there's nothing like a live show for All a right. musician. You know, sure. yeah, I, I agree. Uh, but you know, you do bring up a good point about uh, maybe the good side of this, the silver lining of the COVID cloud, will be that we do slow down a bit. And we do kind of reassess and reevaluate what is really important. And do we need to be running around like chickens with our heads cut off for 16 hours a day? You know, maybe we just should take a little more time with stuff. Okay, so I didn't go to the post office today. I'll go tomorrow. No big deal. And do something else. You know, spend time with your family and with your kids or pet the dog or, you know, just something that has some zen quality about it. (laughs) <laughs> for lack of a better word. Well, dogs, I mean, dogs have got to be rooting for this to never end, right? Because oh, yeah. they're probably the biggest winners of COVID. Yeah, absolutely. People have been home the entire year. They they probably don't know what happened. No, they're, they're enjoying I, it. I think they're enjoying having people around all the time. <laughs> you bring up a good point, though, which is I, I've heard so many people talk about how much they didn't realize they were spending time with loved ones. You know, I have a different experience because I live by myself in Los Angeles. So that's been hard in its own way because, you know, I, I took quarantine very seriously and there were times I didn't see another human being for, for literally months. And so that was really hard, but my family and other people I know who were quarantined with, you know, their, their, spouse or their children, they felt like this was such a great opportunity because they hadn't realized how little of each other 
they were seeing. You know, so there is so much good that can come out of this, I think. Well, that's true. Although the other side of the coin I've heard as well, where people who were used to going to work every day and the husband and wife or domestic partners, whatever, now they were sort of stuck with each other for 24 hours a day and it kind of destroyed the relationships because sometimes you need the break. You do. I mean, I've been married for 15 years very happily, but I don't want to be 24-7 with my wife. She doesn't want to be with me. 24-7, for 24-7, that's right. for sure. <laughs> so, you know, we need that time apart, and then we have our time together. Luckily... Don't you feel like everyone you know during this quarantine either has such a stronger relationship or broke up? Well, I've known both. I mean, I've, I've known yeah, people me. that their relationship crumbled because they couldn't get on with each other for 24 hours a day. On the other hand, there have been ones that were made stronger. So it didn't really affect us too much because we both work, we're self-employed, we have our own businesses, and what I do, I do basically alone, and most of my interactions with people, in fact all of it, is virtual, it's online. So the lockdown didn't really affect me, only in the sense when we were on strict lockdown, like we couldn't go out for dinner. You know, that was about it. Right. So it wasn't that that bad. But uh, for some people who whose bread and butter was performing, uh, they just got killed with this. And I feel really well, bad so for many people. Stores, you see so many stores completely boarded up, so many restaurants, so many performing oh, venues. Yeah. yeah, and those probably it's are not really going to come back. Because you can only last for so long. It's like especially a restaurant. You know, they can't be closed for a year and expect to come back just like nothing happened. You know, they lost a fortune, and some of those are just going to be gone forever, unfortunately. Well, and I think we've also forget, because, I mean, uh, in California, for example, we've had the, uh, they, thankfully, that they, you know, they put a, a moratorium on, on evictions during this, but I don't think that that's the same for, you know, restaurants, and venues, they still have to pay rent. They still have to pay taxes, I think. They, I mean, sure. there's so much yeah. that people still had on their plate without any income coming in. And, and I don't know how some of them are doing it. Now, I mean, obviously, a lot of people couldn't, you know. And, and I, I have so much respect for small business owners and, and just business owners in general going through this time. I, I can't imagine owning my own business. I think it would be so scary. And I just hope that, uh, you know, they find something else. Because with somebody like a, with a restaurant, they board it up, declare bankruptcy, liquidate the business, and they're done. And they start over. Right. And And a lot of them might have at first – taken out emergency loans, taken out, you know, borrowed from their friends or their family or whatever right. just to make payroll. And so now not only do they lose their income and their livelihood, but now they're, they're hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. And it's just, it's a nightmare for, for a lot of those people. So I really do feel Which for Which would them. totally make sense because, I mean, it, I remember, I'm sure as you do, back in March when we all thought it was two weeks. Yeah. Right. And we the two weeks and and you know now a year later. Now a year so later. Was a really long. Yeah, this has been a very long year. Uh we do have to wrap this up. Unfortunately, our time just kind of flew right by. Uh what was the name of the film again and when does it do for release? Oh, it, it's called The Christmas Family Reunion. Uh and it, it actually won't come out until Christmas time. Um so that one that one will be what a good a good nine eight months from now okay well something to look forward to and the last question is do you have a website that you want to give out uh i well i have you know imdb which is pretty much the actor's website um which is just megan davis uh you know on the imdb site and it lists all your projects and and clips and has all, all the pictures from different tv shows and things um i just actually i had just finished a pilot right before quarantine, literally days before lockdown, 
um, that I had shot in New York with uh, Michael Madsen and, and Daniel Baldwin called For Nothing. Um, so that one's on there too. Oh, okay, great. Is that Daniel Baldwin of the Baldwins, the the younger brother? Yeah, or? the brother. Yeah, okay. All right, great. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show and uh, talking and sharing. It was nice meeting you, and uh, best of luck with everything. Thank you. It was really nice meeting you, too, and best of luck. I hope you're still playing um, playing whatever instrument you used to play in the rock band. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see what happens. I'm, I'm migrated into the studio at this point. So just working on yeah. stuff, but we'll see. I hope it does get back to normal for people who depend on performing for their bread and butter. Okay, Megan, take care. Yeah.